really no need to preach. No, from beginning to end, Amy reading the scripture and the worship team, who were my people, and people getting baptized and a family changed forever. And Welcome to the family, y'all. We were, we were so glad to, to, to have you. Um, my name's Skip. I'm, I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I'm the executive pastor here, which means I'm the old guy. <laughs> because apparently you can't do that unless you're the oldest. Uh, I've got a hard message for you today. It's a good message, but it's a hard message, and um, it's about suffering. Yay! Uh, it's going to be great. Um, no, but it is about suffering. It's good. Um, there's some really good things in there, and coincidentally, uh, me and my family have just been suffering like crazy in 2024. It's just nonstop. Um, and so most of this week, just as a means of confessing to start, most of this week I've been walking around crying and yelling at God like a two-year-old toddler. No, really, you can laugh, it's fine. Um, like, a, like a toddler, just because the other day I was having this conversation with God, it was completely one-sided, because um, I didn't leave him any room. Um, and I said, okay, like, when is enough enough? Have you ever asked that question? You guys got to get with me. This is going to get really boring without you. All right? All right? Everybody's in? Everybody good? All right, good. Let's do this. And you know what happened that day after I said, hey, let up a little bit, enough is enough? More happened. And I acted like even more of a petulant child. Nobody can relate to that, can they? No, we take suffering and we go, oh, this is so awesome. I love this. This is the best part of my walk with Christ. No, we're always like, we really quickly want it to be over. We really quickly want to move on. We, we yell out, God, save me from this. Instead of, God, I'm listening which is the posture we need to take, which is listening. Like, suffering comes and we, we almost act like it's some cosmic malfunction that dropped on us. When the word in Matthew says, trouble will come, not might, not could, not there's a chance, will. So trouble will come for you, right? Has anybody had any experience with that? Okay. Good. Show of hands, who's currently suffering? Who's currently lying about that? We had like 10 in the first service. 10 people went, I was lying. <laughs> Sorry. You got me. You asked. I was totally lying about it. It's not the kind of thing we go, hey, Bob, how you doing? Oh, I'm suffering in a pit of despair. And I might cry right now. I'm going to stomp my feet and I'm going to yell and I'm going to do a bunch of stupid things because suffering. And I'm mad and I'm not going to take it anymore, except I am. It's like a curveball. You know, the curve, if you're a baseball fan, the curveball is like known as the dreaded pitch. Like, it's the hardest one to hit. And it starts really young. They don't let them throw a curveball because it's bad for their arm. We let them throw a curveball a little later on in life when they're like 12 because we don't care about them anymore. Um, <laughs> but little leaguers hit great off the tee. They do. They hit great off the team and then off the tee, and then that next year, somebody's throwing them moon balls, and they're cranking it out, and they're hitting like crazy. And then they move up a little bit, and the guys start throwing a little faster, and their batting average goes down a little bit. And then they see the curveball. And you know what they do with the curveball? Swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. 
They've never seen it before. They don't know what it is. They don't know what to do with it. Where did this come from? Why is this coming in on me like that? Why is it turning and twisting? Sounds like suffering, right? Like, what happens, though, is some of them, some of them decide, I'm going to hit the curve. I'm going to hit that thing. And so they find somebody to throw them 10,000 curveballs. And then they hit one. And then they might hit another one. Eventually, they might hit enough of them that they make it to the big leagues, and yet some pitchers will still make them look silly with it. Suffering is like the curveball. That's how we look at it. We look at it like a curveball that came, not like an inevitability, not like something that, oh, we were expecting this, we're prepared. This scripture is telling us, though, we can be expecting it and be prepared. It's a lot easier to hit the curve when you've seen the curve before. Right? So if every time we're suffering, we just go, ah! We're not going to get good at it. Do you want to get good at suffering? Of course you don't. (laughs) Should you? Yes. You should. It should be a time of growth. It should be a time where you're hearing from God. No, we don't want it. We don't pray, Lord, help Betty to suffer today. Like we, We don't do that, but we know that she might be. So, time for some scripture. It's funny because people call, um, people call suffering or things that happen that we're not really fond of, they call them curveballs. It's a pretty common colloquialism. It's like, oh, God threw me a curveball today. And the implication is that you missed it. Right? Not, oh, God threw me a curveball. I knocked that thing out of the park and moved on to my next thing. First Peter. Chapter 2, verse 11. I also might cry during the service anyway, but just don't be worried. (laughs) Verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. Stop there. The end of Tommy's section of this last week. He did the first <coughs> half of um, verse. Excuse me, first half of verse two. Um, it it kind of leaves off calling us a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. And then he begins the next sentence by calling us foreigners and exiles. Same audience. Like, how can it be both? Well, it is both, and it's, it's kind of the tension that we live in, which is in between the two places, right? Um, it, it's the same as our walk with God. Yes, we're going to be glorified. Yes, we're going to go to heaven. Yay. In the meantime, though, you've got stuff, right, that you've got to do, and it feels yucky and, and not good and difficult and impossible, which is a word that Jesus doesn't understand. Like, when you keep telling him it's impossible, he keeps going, what is this word? I didn't, What? What is impossible? What's that mean? Because there's nothing impossible, right? But if we judge it as such, all we're going to do is run up against that suffering, beat our heads against it, and feel sorry for ourselves, and hope some other people feel sorry for us. We might post a vague uh, social media post that says, oh, just when I thought things couldn't get better, dot, dot, dot. (laughs) And then we hope that people respond and go, oh, we love you, and it's whatnot. But we don't actually want to talk about the suffering. We just want to talk about it being over. So we're foreigners, we're exiles, we're slaves, we're called in this section of Scripture. Um, Slaves is an interesting one. When we get to that, don't think slave like cargo ship, plantation, 1860 slave. This This is more of a form of a debtor's prison. If you owed someone money that you couldn't, pay them back, you would become their slave. They would forgive the debt. You would work for them for X amount of time agreed upon. Or the year of Jubilee would happen, which is about every 50 years, and everybody was released on that day. Um, So it's a difficult decision to make, but what it means is you have to do what that person says. That was the deal. That was the deal that was made. 
So it says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against our soul. Sinful desire, not sin. Sinful desires. Do you understand there's a difference, right? Sin's the thing you do. Sinful desires are the things you think about and think about and think about until you do them. Right? He's talking about nipping in the bud. He's talking about going, why do I think about this? What, why am I dwelling on this? Why is that even a thought to me? That's where you got to catch it because you think it enough, you do it. Has anybody here ever sinned? Four of you have sinned. This message is going to be rotten for you. <laughs> Except for you four, you're going to do great. Um, so sinful desires, not sin, the first step, which wage war against your soul. And your soul is what you got. It's all you're going to end up with. It's all you started with. It's kind of all you have now. Right? I mean, we're all thankful that we have a bag of bones and skin to run around in, right? I mean, it's good. It's fun. But my soul is a different thing. My soul is eternal. And God's going to be the overseer of my soul for all of my days. And then all of those days. So anything waging war against our soul. And you can feel it. You can feel it. You can feel it in a tension and an uneasiness and an uncertainty and a difficulty making decisions and a difficulty relating to people and a difficulty in loving your family and a difficulty in relationships and all of those things. They highlight this, right? War is being waged against your soul. And then we act like, whoop, I tripped on that thing and fell into a sin. No, you did not. All right, well, that's one of the verses. <laughs> Verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Such good lives among the pagans. What does that look like? Well, it looks like anything that guides that person toward Jesus. It looks like anything that guides that person toward God and toward faith. This is for, this is for God's sake, not our sakes, right? The, it's, not, it's not good deeds get you to heaven or faith get you to heaven. It's you do good because of who you represent. You do good because you're a slave to the person and you're representing them in everything you do. That's why you do good. Also, it feels kind of nice. Right? Okay, it's going to get tricky now. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. I've done a lot of cross-referencing of every in here, and there's a bunch of different ones um, that are all every. But think about that. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, like all of them. All of them. Not the ones you like. Not the ones you agree with not the ones that live their lives like you, every. It's a hard thing to do, but it, it, it's clear. I mean, I didn't write it. I'm just reading it. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor, which, by the way, the emperor he's talking about is Nero, who was a bad, bad man. Right? He's telling people to submit to Nero's authority. We think in this current day, some of our candidates are bad. They're no Nero. <laughs> Whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Now we're going to talk about politics for a minute. Oh, you can hear a pin drop. Do you want to or are you afraid? 
You okay? Good. Good. Because it's in here, so I mean, I don't. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. I'm going to say it about 10 times. Thank you for asking. (laughs) For it is God's will that by getting on Facebook and calling someone a moron and sending them a meme, because memes are so powerful, (laughs) that you will let them know of their ignorance and how stupid they are, because that's your service to them except they think the exact same thing about you. Stop fighting it out there. Look, this will be my 11th presidential election. I first voted in Reagan versus Carter in 1980. Um, Do the math, I'm the old guy. Um, (laughs) Voting was different then. It was like a different process. Like there was respect in it. There was some of this respecting of authority. Like we called the president the president, no matter if we voted for him or not. We didn't try to do everything we could to slander and besmirch the current president. That's what our vote was for. And the vote was different, too, because in our house, my dad, who's a World War II veteran, so he's a pretty conservative guy, um, he would do all the research, and he would... Watch the evening news. That's all we had, I know. Six o'clock is what we had. Six o'clock, local news, 6.30, evening news. Walter Cronkite, normally. Okay? So this is old school stuff. Um, Old school's good. How many of you woke up this morning and went, man, modern technology has benefited me greatly right now? I mean, you did look at your phone, so I mean, that's part of it, but it was, a, it was a different era, and you know what happened? It was really interesting. My dad would sit us down and explain to us, like, the issues he thought were important, who would be better and whatnot. He would explain that to us, how he was going to vote, inside our house. And then he would go vote, and then the next day, he had a new president regardless of who he voted for. We're just not there anymore. But we need to be better. Us. If we can't start it, if we can't be the ones who represent God in this way, then who can? In all seriousness, if you have a Let's Go Brandon sticker on your car, you should take it off today. disrespectful. It's ugly. You're driving around with the F word on your car? Stop. I don't care who you think is the best candidate, and you'll never know who I think is the best candidate. I will tell you that this election, the 11th, is really hard to find one. Good news, I have a king. That king's going to be on the throne, no matter who the next president is, no matter what happens, that king is on the throne. That king knows me personally. Like, I know the king. I'm not that worried about the election. Y'all going around, running around, going, this is the most consequential thing that's happened ever in our life. It's not. It is not the most consequential thing that has ever happened in your lifetime. It is not. So have a dialogue with someone. But stop all that other crap. It's just garbage. That just tells people that Christians are fakes, that they're ugly. They go to church and they pray and they sing, but then after that, they call me an idiot. We can't, come on, guys. We can't do that. All right, that's it for the politics portion. <laughs> Thank you for hanging in there. Um, anything you didn't like, send it to uh, Jay at, C- at MidtownVineyardChurch.com. Jay handles those things for me. Um, he's a really good friend, and every time I do something stupid, he makes up for it. Thanks, Jay.
Verse 16, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. And again, this isn't slaves as we think of it. Live as an indentured servant to God, because you are. You owe him a debt you can't pay. Unless, right? And this is important, don't miss it, because verse 17 kind of sums up this chapter in, in what I think is a really good way. It's simple, and it's straightforward, and it's true. I didn't write it, but I'm going to read it. Verse 17, show proper respect to... Yeah. You like that one? No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't like it. Don't act like you like it. You don't like it. You like it about as much as I like it. It's clearly written, though. Show proper respect to everyone. The homeless guy, your political opponent. Everyone. Number two, love the family of believers. Not sit with, you, sit with each other for an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday, wave across the way and say, how was your week? Like, do life together. Families do life together. And where people run when there's trouble in the family is toward the family, not away from the family. Right? So the family of believers... This is an amazing family of believers. Really, every one of you, everyone on, it, like, but today is not the penultimate important day in here. Like, we have Monday through Saturday. We don't stop in for a visit, high five God, and then go, no, go do my stuff now. Except we do. Number three, fear God. Not necessarily actual fear, but he's pretty powerful. More a sense of like awe, maybe, and, and submission um, to a deity. And then the fourth one, honor the emperor. We love that one. The current one. The former one. The next one. Why are we going about slander? Why is that important to us? Like, why do we like that? It's kind of like any sin. Like, why, why do we want to slant? Like, why do we want to do that? I'm saying we because we all do it. Could it be one of those sinful desires that wages war against our souls? You should at least ask the question. Verse 18, slaves, again, in reverent fear of God, Submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Which begs the question, who are my masters? Doesn't it? Well, I think you can know just by putting yourself in circumstances with them. Like this or not, um, the IRS is your master. You should try not paying your taxes for a couple of years. It's a really fun experiment. <laughs> nothing ever happens. They forget all about it. They don't come after you or nothing. <laughs> I'm joking, obviously. Or how about the police? Like, when's the last time you got pulled over by the police for speeding and went, why are you pulling me over? This is a waste of all of our time, our tax dollars and everything. This is what you got to do is pull me over? You big dummy. That turns really quick from a ticket to a jail cell. That thing will escalate. They're our masters. If any of you have teenage girls, they're your masters. <laughs> yeah, you know who's laughing hardest? The people with teenage girls. They're like, man, that's true. Holy cow. Teenage girls, wow. Oh, man. I liked raising a teenager so much, I signed up to do it again. <laughs> yeah, that's cute. Verse 19, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, 
because they are conscious of God. Because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it, right? That makes sense. You did wrong, got a beating. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God because it goes back to that other thing that says, live such good lives in front of people. Like when someone is unjustly punished for something and they just let God guide them through it and handle that with grace, we kind of go, that's awesome, right? That's our mandate, is to do it. So all of this comes down to, I don't like the word Christian. I'm not going to use it anymore. I'm done with it. Why, you ask? Um, it doesn't describe me. Christian means little Christ. I don't think that of myself that much. I do know in scriptures like this and numerous other ones throughout the Bible, his mandate to follow him, to be a Christ follower. Christian is something you can decide in your head. Yeah, it makes sense. I'll do it. Bob's doing it. I'll do it. Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Fill it out on the forum. Christian. That's not the goal. Christ follower is the goal. Everywhere in here. Everywhere in this book, Jesus says, follow me, follow me, follow me. Not identify as a me, as a little me, follow me. And in this scripture, follow me into suffering, and I'll show you how to do it, because you don't know, and you need to get better at it. Because it's coming, or you're in it, and I appreciate the bravery of those of you who raised your hands. We all know every one of us could have raised our hand. We don't judge suffering on a scale. Well, that's just a little suffering. This is No, suffering suffering. It's going to come, and you have to cope with it, and you have to get better at it. Otherwise, you're just going to get bogged down in it like I did this week and walk around like a child because I don't like it. I'm tired of it. It's been a crappy year. It's been a lot of stuff. I'm not enjoying myself. I'm currently enjoying myself, but I mean, I'm... <laughs> it's been tough, and it's been tough to watch my wife suffer, and it's been tough to watch my family suffer, and you know that helpless feeling? I... <sighs> but getting better at it is probably the best idea for me. Because like I found this week, as soon as I ask, okay, that's it, right? Boom. Dog gets away, gets hit by a car, killed. Our kids live in two different houses. Lisa and I married seven years ago. And um, it was one of the dogs at the other house. But it hit us like a ton of bricks. You know why? Because we watched our kids just buckle under the suffering of it. And trying to blame themselves and figure out how this could have happened and all the things you do when you're trying to wrap your brain around something that God has put in front of you. So that was his answer when I asked for less. It's like, I think you need more. I hate that answer. But I love Jesus. Maybe he's got a better way for me to do this. I should probably consider that. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you. This is verse 21. Leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Christ suffered for you. You should follow in his steps. Same sentence. That statement is about suffering. He has lots of other places where he asks him to follow in all sorts of different ways. But another one is, take up your cross and follow me. That's serious business. In, in, in John Mark Homer's book, Practicing the Way, which we've all kind of fallen in love with on the staff here, not as much, we still like this better. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, he talks about this, the difference between Christian and Christ follower. 
And, and he talks about this difference between Christian and Christ follower, which is a really valid point. Because he's talking about it as a practice. As a practice, as something he does. As something he does on an ongoing basis. We have to get better at it. We have to learn to hit the curve. His steps and his response to suffering were this, verse 22. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. So when we're suffering... We should commit no sin and have no deceit in our mouth. It's hard, but it's good. I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to go right to communion. Because really the last verses of this really lead into it. Verse 23, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. Grab that one for a minute. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Right? I'm going to read it again. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray. Now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So we're going to take communion together, and um, while that's going on, I asked, I asked Ashton to learn this song. I'd completely forgotten about this song. Um, I think it came out in the 90s. Um, but it used to kind of be my go-to suffering song. <laughs> I know. You've got them, right? You've got a particular song for a particular thing. It used to be my go-to for that. But I hadn't thought of it in years, and somehow that popped up the other day. It was in the midst of the... When's enough enough conversation? Um, because it talks about no matter what happens, I'll praise you. No matter what happens, I'll serve you. No matter what happens, you are my God and you will fight for me. And so I, I called the song up on my, on my phone and played it in the car and um, cried a bunch. So I asked Ashton to learn it, and, um, and she did. And I'd love for all of us who are currently suffering, like at some point here in the close of the service, whether it's during preparation for communion, whether it's during prayer time at the end, no, no matter what it is, like this is, the, this is the key part of the service. This is the, the restaurant will still have food. If they don't, there's other restaurants. Stay and stay and ponder this thing, this suffering thing, and think about Christ's suffering as we take communion. We're going to take communion. There's a station here. There's one over on that wall. There's one over on that wall. And there's one in the back corner in front of that window. So as we're listening and as we're processing and as we're praying, Just open that door a little bit. Let God speak to you. Because it really doesn't matter what I say. Let God speak to you. Something different. There's no point here showing up. Just to show up. You want to hear from God, right? Right? Don't you? It's a lot of trouble to go to, to just hear some words and sing some songs, isn't it? Like, why would you do it? So we're going to respond to suffering.
suffering with praise, and we're going to respond to suffering with worship, and we're going to respond to suffering by having people pray for us and being people that pray for other people. You're one or the other. You're one of those two. There's no spectator section. First of all, everybody in this room needs to be prayed for. Right? Some of you might not be comfortable praying for other people, but most of you are. Let's just not leave without doing that today. So, Father, I ask that you bless this time in communion and in reflection with your spirit. With your spirit that can speak to us through this time. And, and Lord, we are always cognizant of the price you paid for us, of the suffering you endured so that we could suffer well, so that we would have an example, that we would have someone to follow. And as we take this cup and we take this bread, let it be an acknowledgement that we understand the sacrifice and we understand what the suffering was for. Let it renew us in body, mind, and spirit. In Jesus' name. When you feel compelled, come get um, the elements. Take your time. There's no rush to that. Get them, hold them back at your seats, and we'll all take them together.
cross Lord you bled and died for me and if I have to suffer I know that you've been there and I know you're here now even when my heart is torn I will praise you Lord and even when I feel Given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Let's put time together. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. God, we thank you for your gift, your never-ending gift of life and life abundantly because, because you gave yours. We're forever your slaves. That's a debt we can never repay, but we want to represent you well in all that we do. And Lord, for those suffering, bind up the brokenhearted. Be faithful as you've always been. Amen. Hey, before we're done, let's stand together. Um, if you're a sufferer and want to get prayed for, come up front or just ask somebody next to you. If you want to pray for somebody, tell them, hey, I want to pray for you. That's what this part of the service is. Don't not do it. Do it. Ashley's going to sing. When she prays and says amen, you're free to go. You're loved. Justin preached the message during the worship. There's a good father who loves you. You have a great dad. Pressing in.